let's get my sinful confession out of the way. Despite ranking Bioshock right up there with pizza and basic human rights in terms of my favorite things, I never once played the original System Shock or System Shock 2. As much curiosity as I felt about Bioshock's spiritual predecessors, a general aversion to some of the obtuse and sometimes tedious game design of the 90s, as well as the now crude visuals and user interfaces, always kept me away as a gamer spoiled by modern conveniences. So while I'm thrilled to be reviewing a modernized version of one of the first immersive sims, a genre I truly cherish, be either warned or comforted that there's no nostalgia here. I'm experiencing this remake as a fresh experience and judging it by 2023 standards for better or worse. For those uninitiated on what System Shock is about, this is a first-person sci-fi immersive sim focused on story, exploration, combat, and puzzle solving. You play as a hacker trapped aboard Citadel Station, where that station's AI, named Shodan, has lost her goddamn mind after having her ethical constraints removed and taken the crew with her. Citadel Station's inhabitants can now either be found in a dismembered pile on the floor, or roaming the halls as mutants and humanoid cyborgs aiming to force you to join her legion. And you're the only one who can stop her before before she does the same to the people of Earth. For a remake of a 90s game, System Shock is surprisingly accessible. First of all, the difficulty options are much more granular than your typical easy, normal, hard. Rather, you get to choose an easy, normal, or hard difficulty based upon four different dimensions combat, mission, cyber, and puzzle components. Turning the mission toggle to easy will allow you to use waypoints to navigate the station more easily and not allow you to drop any mission critical items. The cyber toggle will determine the difficulty of the cyberspace sequences, which I'll get to in a bit, and naturally the other two difficulty settings, combat and puzzle, are a bit more straightforward. While I'm aware the original System Shock had similar difficulty options, it's great to see regardless and worth pointing out for those like myself who go into remakes a bit skeptical of how well their game design has aged. Although I will say, even if you set everything to easy, some of that skepticism is still warranted, but we will get there. Still, this effectively allows you to make the experience you want. Want a tough as hell combat experience with minimal easy puzzles? You got it. Don't want to be bothered by intense combat and would rather have a more cerebral experience with tricky puzzles and lots of exploration required? You do you, girl. Just know that once you choose the difficulty level for each component, you're stuck with it, so if it doesn't feel right in the first hour or so, you may want to try again. The options thankfully don't end there, as the settings menu allows toggling of things like automatic reloading and crouching, complete rebinding of every key and control, and a large variety of graphical options including DLSS. It feels calibrated to ensure a wide variety of people can find some way that works for them to play the game, and I love to see it. While I'm talking about settings, I might as well mention the Steam Deck. I needed to run through the latest Proton compatibility layer to avoid crashing, and then not only did it boot up without issue, but was easy enough to achieve a semi-consistent 60fps with most settings on low. Cloud save while supported was not working for me though, so my time with the game on deck was pretty limited. I'd say the game works great with a gamepad in general, with the exception of inventory management, which uses a mouse pointer of sorts to navigate for reasons beyond my comprehension, making organization of your inventory a constant pain with a controller. For this reason, I'd say keyboard and mouse is the better way to go, but it's totally playable either way. As might be expected by System Shock's premise, the atmosphere here is borderline suffocating. As you explore the various floors of Citadel Station, machines passively beep and boop beside you, cameras track your movements with excited whirs of enthusiasm, and most areas you encounter are slathered with the gory remains of life that once was. Between the game's sound design and creepy, suspenseful soundtrack, I'd recommend playing with headphones because Night Dive Studios did this atmosphere justice. The voice acting, whether from the audio logs or Shodan herself, is also mostly excellent. The chill I got when Shodan told me, you will learn more about pain than you ever wanted to know was palpable. Real charmer that one. The visual style of System Shock won't be for everyone, but I think it's fantastic. Rather than aiming for an ultra-realistic look for Citadel Station, System Shock goes for a technically ambitious but low-fidelity look. The visual effects such as the lighting in the station or smoky dark corridors marvelously set the scene, but most textures have a deliberately chunky, pixelated look to them. It feels like Night Dive aimed to bring System Shock into 2023 while giving a wink and a nod to its original form, and it's tremendously successful. Now, while there's not much of anything bad to be said about System Shock's presentation, your mileage when actually playing it depends on what you consider a design flaw versus a design decision appropriately faithful to the original game. I enjoyed exploring the various floors of Citadel Station, mapping out its labyrinthine corridors and listening to audio logs that give context to the mess you're in. Exploring thoroughly yields rewards. For example, one audio log will give you a code to a room that allows you to deactivate respawns of some of the more aggressive robot sentences 
entries. You can also pick up hordes of junk that when scrapped or brought to a recycling station can be transformed into money for ammo and weapon upgrades, among other things. Your limited inventory space makes carrying all that junk a bit of a chore at times, but forces you to think carefully about what to take and what to leave. Some mods can be found, such as a basic flashlight, heartbeat monitor of sorts, or a mini-map, though you'll need to be careful, as you have a limited pool of energy and will need to recharge either with batteries you pick up or the limited energy stations scattered throughout each floor. I have to say though, the map was not my favorite. It gets slowly uncovered as you explore each floor and is crucial for navigation, but the icons on it are so tiny and indistinct they're near impossible to see without a lot of zooming in. Even the arrow indicating where your current location is shows up as the most insignificant little blip and the same color as everything else, so sometimes it took me a minute just to find where I was. At several points, I even hit a bug where every single icon on the map disappeared until I rebooted the game. But each time, it took a while to figure out it was even a bug because the icons are normally so hard to find to begin with that I thought I was the problem. But alas, a reboot of the game solved this every time. I should point out as well for people used to more modern game design like myself that the game does virtually nothing to point you in the direction of your next objective. Things like needing to make note of a code you're given is never the slightest bit obvious, and frankly, I had to consult to walk through quite a few times to not wander the halls aimlessly lost for hours. Fans of the original will be right at home, but for those checking this out for the first time, know that this sort of game design has not aged particularly well. As you explore, you'll encounter plenty of enemies, and combat is a mixed bag here, adding equal doses of tension and inconvenience to the proceedings. There's a lack of punch to it. You'll often empty half a clip into a robot for it to not flinch at all, only for that final shot to collapse it into a pile of scrap. There are melee weapons you can use to wail on enemies if your ranged ones are low on ammo, but if that enemy has a gun, you're just begging to be shot repeatedly, with little in the way of effective defensive options. Even for unarmed enemies, like the hideous mutants in the medical bay, smacking them with a wrench doesn't give much of a reaction until the moment of instant death after beating enough ugly out of them. There are a variety of grenades and ranged weapons to keep your options open, and shotgunning a humanoid cyborg in the head to have it explode into piles of gore is as satisfying as it sounds, but the enemies tend to be a bit dumb, sometimes not reacting to their comrade exploding into meat chunks 10 feet away, and sometimes just standing still and shooting at regular intervals, making the most effective strategy hiding around the corner until there's a gap in their shots to take them out. There also seems to be a weird bug where occasionally the attack button just stops working for a second or two, both in the main game and cyberspace. It was never bad enough to unceremoniously kill me, but a bit annoying nevertheless. System Shock's combat is just neither bad nor especially fun, so... Unless you're already familiar with the original or looking for a serious challenge, I'm tempted to recommend you turn enemy difficulty to easy and keep things manageable. The puzzles are a different story though. Frankly, played as just a puzzle and exploration game with chunks of story, System Shock is a pretty good time. Puzzles appear to be randomly generated and show up in the form of things like panels that must be manipulated to connect nodes, similar to Bioshock's pipe connecting minigame, or circuit boards requiring a certain amount of power be supplied by plugging things into just the right spots. On normal difficulty, these puzzles were a great time and occasionally had me stumped for a bit until an obvious solution showed up. They also feel oddly great, with each twist of a panel or plug of a cord having a tactile feel akin to a nice mechanical keyboard. In order to progress, you'll sometimes need to access Cyberspace, an in-game virtual world made up of trippy, colorful neon corridors looking like they were constructed from magnet tiles. Taking in the dizzying array of colors was fun for my first couple runs in Cyberspace, but the more I went in, the more a sense of grading repetition set in. The gameplay of these sections is similar to the classic game Descent or the more recent Overload, but so simplistic that it was hard to feel that excited by it. Shooting the same handful of bullet spongy enemies with my slow, low-powered projectiles felt unsatisfying, even with the power-ups and extra attacks that show up, and the glacial speed with which you move through the virtual landscape at times made me wish for the sequences to move along at a snappier pace. There's a lot to talk about with System Shock, but in summary, you're likely going to get out of it what you put in. Thoroughly exploring Citadel Station can take a couple dozen hours hours or more, especially if you're as stupid as I am about 90s game design where I had to sometimes hug a walkthrough close enough to make out with it. I'd say I enjoyed the experience overall, and the quantum leap in visuals and atmosphere from the original make it a really unique world to spend time in, but certain parts have aged like milk, and the game's generally obtuse and tedious nature is not going to be a good fit for everyone. Veterans of the original are likely to gobble this right up, and I imagine some new fans will too. Just make sure you come with the right expectations. Levels can be accessed by the elevator in, in, in Alpha Quadrant. We hope you have a pleasant stay on Citadel Station. 
Thank you so much for supporting clickbait-free independent content here on YouTube. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to help us bring a voice to the voiceless ones in gaming. And be sure to check out patreon.com slash idreamofindiegames where we can together defeat the gaming echo chamber.